Uh, my name is Vicki Hildebrandt. I'm an assistant professor in the communications department and also a member of the academic symposium committee. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome you to our second day of our uh, 2013 academic symposium entitled Free Speech, Freedom of Speech versus Civility, Where Does One End and the Other Begin? In the next hour, we will be listening to the intersection of freedom of speech and art. Um, I'm here to um, give you a few housekeeping things. Um, please be sure to so, um, put your name on the sign-up sheet. Uh, we want to um, give you credit for um, your attendance here today. And also, you were given an evaluation sheet. We really value the input that you give us um, on these sessions. Um, the committee takes them to heart. and. Um, in the next week or so, we'll again be evaluating what we can do to improve um, our session. But I will now turn this over to Professor Hilary Quella. She is in our art department, teaches photography and fundamentals of art and drawing there. And she is going to introduce our, our speaker who is with us today. Hilary? Good morning. Perfectly fitting within the theme of this year's academic symposium are how ideas within the arts fit into this conversation. Please, we have Dr. Pontinen here today. Dr. Pontinen is an art history professor, art historian, author, Smithsonian, and National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow. Help us welcome Dr. Pontinen. <clears throat> There we are. Sounds good. Is that good? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Quella, for inviting me to talk at this symposium. Um, told that many of you are not art majors. So initial question is, well, if I'm in business, I'm in nursing, I'm in engineering, why should I have to endure a symposium on the fine arts? Um, I will try to convince you uh, that the fine arts or being cultured is essential. If you have an uncultured nurse, if you have an uncultured engineer, if you have an uncultured lawyer, you have a society which is dysfunctional. Now, a lot of my research focuses on that pr proposition, that we are increasingly living in an uncultured society. Uh, the issue of quality of speech and act is what I'm really trying to address today. <clears throat> the fine arts are, are included in the notion of free speech. There have been some uh, Supreme Court decisions that have established that. So we're not just talking about speech, but we're also talking as, about actions as a form of speech. And the issue then is, well, what constitutes publicly acceptable speech? Uh, one reason I was invited was I wrote an article on a proposed project uh, in Milwaukee called the Blue Shirt. Now the Blue Shirt, uh, this is a, uh, I'm sorry about the bad image. This was a proposed uh, um, governmentally funded work of art uh, to be constructed on the parking garage at, uh, at the airport, uh, um, Mitchell Airport. Now, this project caused a lot of controversy. And the controversy centered on, is this worth spending money on? This raised all sorts of issues, not only about the importance of public art, but also the role of public funding in the production of public art. And it also raised the question of the quality of the art being produced, the quality of the speech, the quality of the artistic act as being publicly significant. I'm not going to talk in detail about the blue shirt controversy. You can find my article online if you want to read it. But the, uh, st uh, the um, 
committee in Milwaukee decided to defund the production of the blue shirt as a public work of art. Now, typically, the art community viewed this as an act of censorship. And the issue of whether public funding should be provided for artistic expression raised a whole bunch of issues uh, centering on free speech and what should be acceptable as free speech. <coughs> now, there's a early work of art by an American artist named John Trumbull who fought in the Revolutionary War. I'm just using it as a template. We all know about the First Amendment. The First Amendment establishes freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But the problem is, how did they define freedom of speech? Now, it's been my experience in a lot of classes that a lot of folks presume that freedom of speech now means you have the right to say whatever you want. So freedom is equated with a lack of restraint. Now, the, the assumption that freedom is a lack of rules is common today. But if you examine it intellectually or in terms of case law or in terms of cultural impact, the notion that free speech means you can say whatever you want is an affirmation of anarchy. This is a famous American work of art by an artist named Ben Sean, depicting two anarchists named Sockel and Vanzetti who are in their coffins. And this was a controversial trial. Sockel and Vanzetti were convicted. I wanted to avoid holding this thing, and now I'm going to hold it anyway, aren't I? We're convicted of being anarchists, of publicly advocating the overthrow of the American government. This became a controversial trial. Ben Sean came out down on the side that this was an evil um, um, use of jurisprudence to oppress free speech. Again, I won't get into the details. <laughs> They've been doing forensic studies on the uh, Sockel and Vanzetti as to whether they were actually guilty of anarchy or not. But the assumption that free speech means you can say whatever you want really makes no intellectual or cultural sense. The most obvious, is this still working? Uh, the most obvious example, which is common knowledge, I presume everybody's heard it, you can't yell fire it. You can't yell fire in a uh, movie house. Sorry. So if free speech isn't saying whatever you want, then how is the First Amendment to be understood? What does the First Amendment actually um, defend? Now, I often ask my students, what would George Washington think of this work of art? For those of you who are not familiar with this object, this object was voted by the British Association of Art Historians as being the most important work of art produced in the 20th century. It's by a French artist named Marcel Duchamp. The title of it is The Fountain. It is a toilet. Now, if George Washington or the founders who established the First Amendment walked into a gallery, would they be inclined to defend a toilet as a work of free speech? Now, it gets even trickier in that regard. Other works of art... also raise serious questions. This is a work by a, a uh, French artist named Matisse, 
entitled The Blue Nude. And when this object was shown in, an, in uh, the, uh, a, a, the Armory Show, an important show at the beginning of the 20th century, this was viewed as obscenity. It was viewed as obscenity when this um, uh, painting was displayed at the Art Institute of Chicago. The art students revolted and hung an effigy of Matisse in protest. So this problem of free speech being more than saying whatever you want, and the problem of free speech being subsidized by the government or not, whether you're an individual or a, an artist, there is a qualitative problem involved with free speech. Can free speech be obscene? Can free speech be oppressive? Can free speech be prejudicial? And this is where you get into a terribly sticky wicket. I assume that most people in this room look at this painting and say, what's the big deal? And the fact that a lot of people in this room presumably look at this painting and say, what's the big deal, may be the problem. Which is why I like teaching art history, because it helps history helps us escape the prison of the present. That which we presume to be acceptable at the moment may or may not be worthy of being acceptable. Now, why were people so upset about this painting? Because it was viewed as an assault upon the nude. And what is the nude? I asked my students, what's the difference between the nude and the naked? What's the difference between fine art and pornography? And typically, people can't figure it out. Nor could the Supreme Court. Potter Stewart famously said, I can't define pornography, but I know when I see it. So the issue of obscenity in public expression and its interaction with free speech is a critical one up to the present. What is so upsetting about this painting? To the view of people used to thinking of the nude, the nude is the material realization of the ideal. The nude is humanity attaining perfection. The nude is associated with rationality. The great philosopher Boethius stated that a person is a rational being. That's why dogs aren't people. So this painting was viewed as being an assault upon rationality. You look at the face, you look at the, 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 the uh, visage of this depiction of the blue nude, and this isn't a nude anymore because there's no rationality connected with the appearance of the face. So people at the time who were far more accustomed to work such as this, you look at the face of this woman and you see a rational being. And as a rational being, a qualitative statement is being made that to be rational, to realize truth or goodness or beauty is reaching for an ideal which all cultured people ought to seek. Uh, this is a drawing by an artist and art historian named Kenneth Cox, who taught at Princeton University. And when he evaluated the Armory Show and he evaluated the Blue Nude, he expressed these concerns. So the, the fact that we don't even blink at the Blue Nude may be a source of shame rather than indifference. <laughs> so these nudes are not naked. And how are they more than animals? Because of the rationality that's implicit to the idealization of form. Now, the issue of quality, and I apologize for the name of this, uh, this work of art. I don't make the, 
I didn't make it, but somebody did. The issue of quality in thought, word, and deed has become deeply problematical in contemporary America. This goes beyond what would George Washington think about this as a work of art. You can read the title on your own. If you have trouble seeing it from the back, I'm not sure. Well, I don't even, um, artist murder. Now, if a society accepts a can of, pardon, pardon me, a can of crap as, work, as a work of art, please don't presume that this doesn't matter if you're in engineering or you're in nursing or you're in education. At one point in my career, I dropped out and I said, okay, I'm gonna go to law school, I may as well make some money. And when I got to law school, I was taught, you can't define justice. Just as I was taught in art school, you can't define beauty. Just as I was told in, in, uh, as an engineer that there is no, there's no moral content to technology. So this denial of the notion of quality in art, and I think that's implicit, to a can of crap being presented as a work of art, a work of fine art. If you walk into an art gallery and you are disturbed by what's in the art gallery, be aware that the law is simply culture with a stick. Now, how is the issue of the quality of what we do? Addressed. It's an infamous work, some of you are familiar with it. Andre Serrano, Piss Christ. So the artist takes a crucifixion, puts it into a jar of urine, and demands that this be acceptable in the public realm as an act of free expression. But is this offensive? Should this be an act of public expression? Uh, Serrano, uh, th there's been all sorts of literature about the, this, this uh, um, work of art. And it's fascinating to read some of the rationalizations. Some folks have tried to make the argument that this actually represents Serrano's sincere attempt to display the dilemma of Christianity in a world full of sin. There's been a lot of uh, uh, ink spilt. Uh, if you know what uh, Serrano's recent work is, he's done a whole series of high resolution up close photography of crap. Now I didn't come here to talk potty with you, but this is a serious problem. Should a Christian be offended and view this as hate speech? Alternatively, Should the non-Christian view this work as hate speech? Is it, you can read it as well as I can, Duccio. Virgin and Child and Majesty. This object advocates a specific qualitative moral and cultural paradigm. That paradigm is viewed not as a personal statement, but as a statement of the nature of reality. So this object, this tradition, argues, for example, for the morality of marriage as a sacrament, a different tradition, for example, the Marxist views marriage not as a sacrament, but as a fundamental source of oppression. 
So from a Marxist viewpoint, this art is objectable, uh, ob objectionable. From a Christian viewpoint, Marxist art or the art of Serrano is objectionable. So everybody has the chance to be offended, which is, a, I, I think, part of the contemporary cultural scene in America today. Whoever can successfully be most effectively offended is viewed as the victim, and then the victim is able to assert influence. How is quality determined today? One attempt to explain quality is by the paradigm called modernism. And when I refer to modernism, I'm referring to a set of ideas particularly articulated by a German philosopher named Immanuel Kant. And modernism is, has been extremely influential. According to modernism, we live in a world of facts. How we put those facts together is a matter of personal preference. For example, I can get a bunch of facts to prove that Fond du Lac is a wonderful place to live. Someone else can collect a set of facts to prove that Fond du Lac is a lousy place to live. So we manufacture truth. Now, in a world of facts, well then, how do you judge quality? How do you judge the quality of what you want to do or be? Immanuel Kant's solution is that judgments of quality are grounded in genius. And genius can't be taught. You either have it or you don't. This work of art was subject to the, the issue of free speech, subsidized speech, free action, all the issues that are part of your symposium. It's by an artist named Richard Serra. It's up there on top. Tilted Arc. And if you have a close-up, Tilted Arc, as you can read, is 120 feet long, 12 feet high. It's a unpainted, unrefined piece of core 10 steel spanning across a courtyard in Lower Manhattan. The artist's uh, statement was that this was funded by the NEA. He is a bona fide artist, so he's a recognized genius. And he's bestowing this object, federally funded, to be placed across the plaza in Lower New York, uh, uh, Delhi Square, was it? F Federal Plaza. The dilemma was that the people in the community, particularly the people who worked in these offices surrounding this square, this, uh, square were deeply disturbed because they liked to hang out on the plaza, particularly in the summer, and have their lunches and, and socialize. So it, their, their public space was lobotomized. So the people in the office buildings complained that this artistic project interfered with the quality of their life. So here you have a fascinating conflict between the genius or the expert versus the rights of the public. This object was dismantled. It was taken out of uh, Lower Manhattan. Last I heard, it's in Hoboken, New Jersey where it might effectively uh, 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 merge with the uh, surroundings. I'm sorry if anybody's from New Jersey, I'm just making a bad joke. But beyond the joke, this is a serious issue. How do we judge the quality of what we make and do? And how do we judge the quality of the public realm? You know, we may like something personally, and that's nice, and we can all like different things, and as long as it's it's in the privacy of our homes. It doesn't have a major impact, at least on society. But 
as John Stuart Mill said in his essay on liberty, the right to act and the right to be left alone conflict. And where the right to act and the right to be left alone conflict, society has to make a qualitative public judgment about what's good. So you have the Bonner's tradition that argues that the genius, either in the studio or the professor, and how many of you assume that I'm a genius? I hope none. The artist or the expert having the mystery of science or the mystery of art or the mystery of culture in their personal possession and therefore will deem upon the public what is good. This occurs in science, in technology, in culture, in law. The idea of the expert or the genius bestowing upon the public what's, what's good, like pearls before swine. That modern tradition is contested by another contemporary viewpoint called the postmodern. And the postmodern position is represented by this painting by Vincent van Gogh. Now, if you look at the painting, you see an old pair of shoes. What's the big deal? How is this a work of fine art? I don't see the nude. I don't see ideals. I don't see anything profound or deep. The postmodern position, literally postmodern, says we don't buy genius. So we are anti genius. We don't buy fine art. We are anti fine art. Meaning in life is established by being authentic. And according to most postmodernists today, authenticity is grounded in factual experience. In other words, it's based upon race, gender, or economic class. So if you want to pursue these ideas more, this famous essay by a, a uh, a philosopher named Martin Heidegger who wrote about Van Gogh's shoes and this idea of authenticity on a vulgar level is Nike still doing the ads just do it no well maybe that's that's a good sign so being authentic in terms of race gender or economic class or as Nietzsche would put it as a uh, un unfettered individual I'm going too fast on that one. Our two major contending viewpoints today, the modernist and the postmodernist. Now, the dilemma with both is this assumption that truth is based upon fact. And I'm watching some folks nod off here, so I'm, I'm getting worried here. Uh, which is better, Catholicism or Marxism? Which is better? I mean, you can take your pick, utilitarianism or Buddhism. The notion of making qualitative judgments is the core issue that's facing, and feedback on, 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 a, on a microphone, apparently. Now, the... I often ask my, my classes, uh, which is better, Bambi or venison? <laughs> which is better, the rainforest or lumber? And of course, it gets, it gets really problematical very quickly. Which is better, choice or life? So we're faced with the, the problem of quality in science, in ethics, and art. But the problem is, how do you judge quality if everything is based upon fact? If truth is fact, then all knowledge is relational. And if all knowledge is relational, we can only be tolerant or authentic. 
probably have to go through that again. If Buddhism is one social way of living, and Marxism is another social way of living, then from a factual point of view, we don't figure out whether Buddhism or Marxism are true. We worry about how Marxists and Buddhists will get along. So the reduction of knowledge to fact results in us no longer trying to understand reality in life, but worrying about how we react with each other. Let me try to explain this again. This is difficult. I'm hoping at Marion College some of these ideas will be obvious to you. I assure you that in many other colleges they are not. I often ask my classes, uh, can I find something to drop? Uh, What makes the book fall? Well, what causes gravity? The attraction of masses. What causes the attraction of masses? The attraction of protons and neutrons. What causes the attraction of protons and neutrons? The attraction of protrinos and neutrinos. Well, what uh, causes that? Well, we'll call them quarks. We're not sure. Uh, the, uh, the term quark, by the way, comes from uh, James Joyce. Please note that if you simply describe in greater detail the book falling, you haven't explained anything. You've simply described it in greater detail. One explanation for why the book falls is it's an accident. If the universe is an accident, then we are accidents. Another explanation for why the book falls is that the whole universe is a machine. Well, if the whole universe is a machine, I, I used to make the, 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 the joke that then we all have to dance disco forever, but that's a dated joke now, isn't it? Yeah. Anybody know how Dante explains why the book falls? Come on, Marion University? Louder, please. I can do that? I make, uh, I make gravity. If you've read the Divine Comedy, the last section, gravity is love. Now, we tend to assume that facts are explanations. Let me suggest that facts are explanations only for the shallow and violent-minded. <coughs> I also ask my students, which is better, vanilla or chocolate ice cream? Anybody for vanilla? Please, you know, help me out. Vanilla, chocolate, oh, that's interesting, <laughs> strawberry. <laughs> Way to go. <coughs> Gustavus non disputandum. There's no disputing taste, right? Which is better, chocolate ice cream or cyanide ice cream? <laughs> is that a matter of taste? Or is it a qualitative matter of knowledge? So because we're so busy memorizing facts, and presuming that the world is factual, and maybe we believe in God, and maybe we don't. But the world is factual. <coughs> Therefore, all qualitative judgments about life are social. Therefore, we have to worry about offending other people. Therefore, what happens to free speech if we have to worry about offending people rather than try to understand and make a good society? So the postmodern position on knowledge as fact denies the pursuit of wisdom and beauty 
and demands that we not offend each other. This results in cultural relativism, which drives me nuts. I have students, I ask my students, have you been taught that all cultural viewpoints are equally valid, equally valuable, and whatever we personally are is our business, but we mustn't impose our values on others? I ask them, does anybody here believe that slavery is right? Does anybody here believe that rape is right? Does anybody here believe that cannibalism is right? I happen to think that cannibalism, rape, slavery, racism are ugly and wrong. So call me a bigot if you want. I claim to try to be civilized. So this, not to digress too much, but I wrote a dissertation on Chinese Taoism. I'm at the Smithsonian looking at Taoist sculpture in the vaults of the Freer Gallery. I ask a professor there, uh, not professor, curator, is Taoist art true? He said, you're not supposed to ask that question. It's inappropriate. If we don't ask and try to figure out whether Taoism or Buddhism or Confucianism or Christianity or Marxism are true, then what is the point of the intellectual and cultural life? So the f issue of free speech in fine art is a cultural one. But culture affects all majors, all activities, all people. And I think we live in a dangerous time now where being cultured is not viewed as really being important. And if culture isn't important, then the quality of our speech is not only denied, but the freedom to speak the truth as best we see it is denied. So if you accept the premise that truth is fact and all cultural traditions are factual, and therefore all cultural traditions are equally factually valid, and that qualitative distinctions make no sense, think about that the next time you're in the grocery store. Does anybody here check the date of milk when they buy milk? That's prejudicial. So, <clears throat> I've written a couple of books. One is on what happened to beauty. Beauty used to be understood as the splendor of wisdom. And wisdom, of course, is what's true and good. Wrote a second book on what happened to science. The limitation of science to fact is called scientism. But in a world of facts, nothing has any meaning, qualitative or otherwise. So we are taught to be existentialists. The most recent book um, finished, I just finished, is on culture and the renewal of the liberal and fine arts. I hope we can renew the liberal and fine arts so we can enjoy speech which is not only free, but also good. Because I hope at Marion University, it won't offend too many people to present the reminder that it's not just uttering whatever you want, and it's not bullying other people by which we become free. It's truth, the pursuit of truth that makes us free. Free from ignorance, free from arrogance, free from brutality. So I hope we can all become cultured and you can buy my books so I can be cultured in Rome.
I hope that was close enough to the time span. Any questions? Um, I, I, I recognize you, you, you guys don't know me, so you know it's, you might hesitate to ask anything. I promise to be polite and civilized. I'm interested on your thought process in creating and presenting this presentation this morning. Could you share with us what you were thinking about in anticipation of your remarks that you just delivered? I'm sure that freedom and quality need to be combined. Free speech to say nonsense or nasty things isn't free speech. So it's the qualitative aspect of free speech, which legitimatizes both the liberal and the fine arts. So that's the, uh, um, am I missing your, your, your question here? And I forgot to change the last picture. Let's get past the shoes. Uh-oh, how do I do this here? This is an illustration of my second book, Ahead of Yale, Colonial America. And if you can make out the books, there's, there's books on China, books on, on uh, ancient Rome, books on, uh, by Newton. So the, co the, the cosmopolitan pursuit of wisdom is the option which I am trying to defend. Let me take another crack at it. Uh, some people in the room are uh, professors and the vast majority are students. And here's the challenge that, that I have, is that when I reflect about my interaction with the students, I'm trying to convey sometimes abstract ideas and make it tangible. When you're working with your students, because you referenced them several times throughout your remarks, I like to know what is it that you're thinking about to convey what is in your mind and the thoughts that you possess in trying to craft a presentation that would be meaningful to our students who are assembled here this morning and particularly what you do in the classroom and elsewhere. Well, the, the initial task is to make people care which is why I prefaced the remarks today by stating that if you're an uncultured person, then whatever you do professionally and personally is, is sadly affected. So once we get past this academic mindset, that this is school and not reality, so an awful lot of people presume that culture at best is something you do on the weekend. You go maybe to the Art Institute or, or the Milwaukee Art Gallery because you've heard that somehow it's supposed to be good and important for you, but it's not really connected with your daily life. Or some people go to Mass on Sunday but don't really consider that they need to have a spiritual life all the time. So reconnecting education with practical day-to-day -day activity is essential. I would argue that an awful lot of professors today teach from specialized and obscure positions, at least at my university, but probably not here. And I certainly know that the liberal arts are woefully defended. How many of us have read the defenses of the liberal arts that it, it, it promotes critical thinking, it, it pr uh, promotes analytical uh, skills, uh, it, uh, uh, all these job-related um, justifications for the liberal arts. I would argue that the fundamental justification for the liberal arts is that it makes us better people as a matter of condition. Not as a matter of race or gender or economic class, but the liberal arts and the fine arts can make us conditionally better. And if we can convince other people that the quality of their own lives are at stake, 
and effectively teach things that address the quality of people's actual lives, then I think you can have a serious dialogue. What college do you teach at? Uh, UW Oshkosh. Okay, thank you. And that was very difficult, frankly, because I believe in the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty, not fact and power. So I had more than one job interview that was really dicey. If you think the stuff doesn't affect you, I think that's a naive proposition for whatever you end up doing in your life that which is popular both in academia and in professional contexts varies for better or worse. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, you'd mentioned something that I've been noticing over the last two uh, probably 20 years in higher education about how the, the, the purpose of higher education has drifted towards job readiness and job preparedness. And I'd like to hear your thoughts about how that has uh, affected the, the, the breadth of the studies and the, and the focus on the liberal arts, at which our stu many of our students don't know what it used to be like to yeah. have a focus yeah. on the liberal arts. Yeah, I think the liberal arts are, have, have collapsed, turning much of higher education into high school with beer in the hopes of getting a job. More broadly, I, mean, I don't get too abstract here, but more broadly, I think the fundamental assumptions today that are becoming increasingly common is that life is based upon the pursuit of pleasure while keeping the streams clean. So hedonism and ecology have replaced seeking a meaningful life. The, the, the whole series of books that have come out lamenting the collapse of the liberal arts what I find fascinating, I mean, I, mean I, I ask students, can you name me some immoral science? People say, well, how can you have immoral science? The Nazis didn't come out of the woodwork all by themselves. Is it scientifically, if science is fact, then it's scientifically true that we can genetically improve chickens. If we can genetically improve chickens factually, why not improve people factually? So the whole rise of eugenics as a science in the 19th century marks a tragedy. I am particularly interested in Western medieval thought and in Chinese thought. In Chinese society and in traditional Western society, to have a position of public influence in business or in just the, the public realm, you were expected to be cultured. In China, you had to pass a test proving that you were at least knowledgeable of what it means to be cultured to be appointed. So Chinese civilization took for granted that when you get out of college and get a job, your employer should look to see if you're cultured. The same thing in the West. Today, the argument that employers should seek people who are civilized is laughed at. And then we wonder why we have a brutal 
or increasingly brutal society. So I think that until, and, and I think the two root causes of the collapse of civilized society, and I can give you lots of sources, serious sources, not, not Oprah stuff or Jerry Springer still on. Um, yeah, gosh. <laughs> and, and, and lots of sources from left, so-called left-wing and so-called right-wing perspectives. The lack of influence of being civilized today marks a return to barbarism. I'm not talking about clipping hair. Uh, if, uh, a significant text in that regard is After Virtue by uh, Alistair McIntyre, but, but I mean, there's dozens of them that, that I can give. I ask my students, how many of you uh, go to college to obtain a glimpse of wisdom that can improve your life forever? And at least where I teach, a nervous or hostile smirk is common. Of course, if you go to college to get a job, how do you recognize what a good job is? And after you get the job and you can pay all the bills, so I, I, I ask my students, uh, when, when you turn 30 and you're paying the bills and you have the job and you don't know what it's for, think of me. Some of them laugh. <laughs> oh, come on, give me a hardball one. Somebody. I'm used to being attacked. Uh, it's not a hardball question. Uh, what's the best book you've read in the past year? I finally got around to Etienne Gilson's History of Medieval Philosophy. I think it's a fabulous text. Um, the best book, I mean, th there's more than one. I, I think the best books are the books that seek wisdom rather than viewing life as a conflict between race, gender, and economic class. How can we as college students use art to decrease incivility? To decrease? <laughs> ah, the dilemma. Now, as an art historian, I, I wrote a whole bunch of modernist articles, a bunch of facts, you know. And uh, they were scholarly and fine. As soon as I started questioning modern and postmodern art history, all of a sudden, the quality of my scholarship got worse. I got rejected a lot. Same dilemma for the studio artist. You know, it, it, if your studio art is quickly accepted, that's usually a bad sign. If it's never rejected, uh, accepted, it, that's also a bad sign. But the plan I'm trying to say is that, that popularity, uh, peer review drives me nuts. <laughs> I mean, to be a successful artist or scholar in Nazi Germany, your peers determined that you had to be a Nazi. To be a successful scholar in, in Stalinist Russia, your peers insisted that you be Lenin Marxist. Today, an awful lot of peer review <coughs> is done by postmodernists. 
So if you uh, try to address the meaning of life, truth, goodness, and beauty, and the gallery or your peers view that as absurd, then you have a tough road to hoe. Uh, I would recommend that in what we do and also in what we make, there's personal satisfaction, there's public acceptance, but then the higher level is whether what we do and make actually is good. So I would recommend that you strive for what's actually good, even if it hurts. And it will hurt. Well, I think that's an excellent note to, to leave us with. Thank you so much for your um, thought-provoking ideas. and. Thank you all for coming.